We're back, baby. Not that we went anywhere. Oopsie. The worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink. I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mota Zitabanakis, see, welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lucene. We are officially in football season, so we are dropping some pre-recorded episodes. Um, But hey, the best one that I've done so far apparently was top 10 face turns. So we're dropping another top 10 episode today. We are doing top 10 returns in WWE. Uh, So hey, if you guys want uh, you can hit me up on all my socials at Jack Lucene, or you can send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. We will be doing more of these top tens. If you guys have ideas, stuff you want to see for the top 10 shows, please feel free to hit me up uh, and send in your ideas. But otherwise, we are on our way with number 10. <laughs> Is there a better sound in professional wrestling than when the glass breaks and Stone Cold Steve Austin returns? Uh, This one being when Stone Cold returned to help the WWF against the Alliance. Probably the best part of this whole fucking convoluted ass storyline. So if you guys do not remember, flashback, Austin had turned heel at WrestleMania. And uh, this was Vince McMahon begging the old Stone Cold Steve Austin to come back uh, and uh, a dejected, a sad looking Stone Cold Steve Austin left. And he went uh, and he uh, we would see him out drinking. Uh, And then towards the end of the next week's show, you would see the WWF getting attacked. First by WCW, and then uh, more WWF guys would come out, and then all of a sudden all the ECW guys would come out, and all of a sudden you had the Alliance in full, and you had the ring full of bodies. Uh, The WWF guys starting to lose, and then all of a sudden in the back you see the truck pull up, and it's Stone Cold. Stone Cold is here, and he jumps out, and he starts whooping ass, open up a can of whoop ass, on uh, random ECW and WCW guys. And I tell you the nervous energy that builds and the pop when the glass finally breaks for this one, one of my favorite stone cold returns of all time, even though technically he wasn't actually like gone that long or anything. This, this still qualifies to me now because he would then join the Alliance and they would have this really convoluted ass angle where it was like, I, if I remember right, I think it was like Stone Cold was the leader of the Alliance and then turned out to be a spy like plant for WWF. And Kurt Angle turned out to be the opposite for like WC. It was like a whole mess. This, this fucking storyline. But, anyways, we'll move on to number nine right after this bong toke. Number nine, Jan Cena. <laughs> John Cena returns at Royal Rumble 2008. <laughs> so coming back <coughs> early from the torn pectoral, uh, John Cena would uh, come in at number 30 of that year's Royal Rumble. And end up winning the whole damn thing. Uh, But yeah, probably one of the truest, biggest pops that Cena ever got in his entire career. Because (laughs) much later in his career, like obviously like nowadays, he gets pops because, you know, he has achieved kind of legend status. But back then, 
You know, Cena was very, you know, when they say John Cena was a polarizing figure, it's funny because I feel like that was true of John Cena, whereas like now they just kind of flippantly like to throw that around uh, <coughs> for other guys. <coughs> but I really think uh, John Cena was truly a polarizing figure. But this was, you know, absence doth make the heart grow fonder. Cena, when he returned at the Royal Rumble 2008, got a massive ovation. <coughs> Number seven. The Rock, the final boss. So The Rock, <laughs> The Rock's had several returns, uh, most notably returning as a heel as Hollywood Rock, and then again in, I think it was 2011, uh, when he returned to face John Cena once in a lifetime at WrestleMania, which turned out to be two times in a lifetime. But <laughs> even though it's a little bit of recency bias, I think The Rock's return leading up to WrestleMania and unto WrestleMania and culminating at WrestleMania 40 in both the tag match and the uh, <coughs> Bloodline Rules Championship match between Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns, uh, I really think like this was the best return that the rock has had in his career, which is saying something because the rock, like I said, has had several amazing returns in his career. But I really think like, you know, the pop, when he came out uh, with Pat McAfee to clown on Austin theory, like that was already crazy. But then when he actually like came back, back, like, Oh, this is going to be like a thing where the rocks coming out, like semi weekly for television appearances leading up to WrestleMania. Like that was crazy and him you know going on about oh wrestling is cool again i mean you felt the electricity of the rock and you know we'll, we'll talk about this oh i skipped right over number eight so i guess we'll call this number eight sorry uh so well i was gonna say we'll talk about this in the next segment i already fucked my numbers up that's why this is the worst wrestling podcast guys so we had 10 9 8 we're calling this eight sorry uh, so in the next segment, we'll talk about kind of the same situation of when the rock returned this time. Uh, and yes, he had the gravitas when he returned in 2011, but like even more so, I feel like this time where it's like, you've had even another decade of the rock being the world's biggest movie star, basically him returning this time around with Roman Reigns, with the bloodline connection, the idea that he was usurping Cody Rhodes for the WrestleMania spot. And then ultimately it would lead to, uh, like I said, the feud as a uh, between Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins and The Rock and Roman Reigns and how that all culminated at WrestleMania, I think, turned out to be a beautiful thing. So since we fucked up the order already, let's get into number seven which technically should have been number eight, Brock Lesnar returns to the WWE April 2nd, 2012, attacking John Cena. So kind of what I was getting at in the last segment uh, about The Rock coming back as the final boss, where quite truly and literally The Rock had built himself even above being just a movie star like you know, again, being a, uh, what is it, like the, the he's like the president of whatever the name of that company is, uh, fucking, I forget, some some stupid bullshit name, name that doesn't actually mean, Enigma, let's just say Enigma Enterprises or whatever the fuck it is, um, someone out there will correct me, people love correcting people on the internet, but anyways, just the again the idea that he is like even ascended past this level of like being just a movie star of like oh no he's like an EVP like legitimately like he has he pulls weight as like a producer because he's not just like the world's biggest movie star or Hall of Famer but like businessman uh, business owner you know uh, entrepreneur mogul all of these titles. Uh, fitting and bestowing upon the rock. So again, how does that lead into Brock Lesnar? Well, Brock Lesnar 
already had an incredible career when he left the WWE after having wrestled at WrestleMania 20 against Goldberg and what was a pretty shitacular match. Uh, but like his resume up until that point already multiple time WWE champion having wrestled Kurt Angle at WrestleMania, like, you know, Brock was the real deal. And so him leaving was kind of crazy. Actually. I remember when that happened, I was like, Oh, like I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> that had never really happened in my lifetime for a star that big. Uh, you know, obviously like, cause I, and again, I came in, during the Attitude Era, and granted, there were guys flipping between WWF and WCW, but I mean, like, when there were, like, true homegrown guys, it felt like they just stayed in WWF forever. It wasn't until I got a little bit older that, like, oh, all of a sudden, Kurt Angle popped up in, like, TNA, and then, like, you know, I remember this one, uh, Brock Lesnar leaving and deciding to go to the NFL and then going to the UFC. And so this is the thing of, like, Going to the UFC and becoming a UFC heavyweight champion and then returning to WWE at that time in 2012 legitimized Brock Lesnar on this roster in a way that nobody else had. He was like he was already uh the like a the beast, like the the next big thing, Brock Lesnar. And then like, you know, you, you already had like the NCAA records and career and then now you're tacking on the fact that like he is a legitimate former ufc heavyweight champion of the world like that's fucking crazy in terms of kayfabe so the way that they then were able to use that not only for the feud with cena which would then lead to suplex city bitch not only for then you know, the run uh, to beating the streak with The Undertaker and the feud therein after that, but all the stuff with Roman Reigns, like the the run of dominance with the title that Brock had himself before Roman Reigns carried it for fucking four years, uh, and then also Brock setting himself up quite literally as like a mini boss of sorts uh you know for cody rhodes coming out of the loss of wrestlemania like again the career that brock lesnar had was already you could argue close to being a hall of fame career and however you feel about him as a person like the return especially again in 2012 which was a dry that was a pretty dry time uh, for WWE where things were not, they definitely weren't as hot as they were now, you know, just to put it in perspective, like, you know, in 2012, it was starting to get a little bit hokey. The stuff with Cena was really starting to wear thin with people. And Lesnar returning really gave them kind of a shot in the arm and then again, that also culminated. So that also culminated at the same time. It's crazy to think how like Lesnar returning and breaking the streak was at the same WrestleMania that Daniel Bryan, you know, uh, completed the Yes Movement. Movement. It really feels like those two things coincided to kind of like, you know, really deliver a high uh, for rest for professional wrestling. And then it did kind of feels like it died out a little bit after that too. But like. You know, I think uh, there were ebbs and flows during the 2010s, like all the way from like, honestly, like 09, which is 2009, 2008, 2009. It's like about when I kind of stopped watching, like, you know, as like a true diehard fan having grown up with it, where it was like, I would watch the pay-per-views and that's about it. But... I remember like Brock Lesnar returning and the Daniel Bryan stuff like the that brought me all the way back. So, you know, I think uh, this has a special place in my heart because not only did Brock Lesnar return, I really think this is when my fandom as a WWE fan really returned. All right. Now we're back on track a little bit and in order. Let's get to number six. Stone Cold! Stone Cold!
Okay. But for real, uh, this is the actual Stone Cold return. Uh, so this one is one of my favorites, um, especially because, again, it holds a special place in my heart. The Rock and Stone Cold very much my 1A and 1B growing up in terms of favorite professional wrestlers. <laughs> and Triple H was a guy that I just loved to hate. So the fact that they all coalesce in this one match together where it's The Rock versus Triple H for the WWE Championship. This is in the thralls of the McMahon-Helmsley era. And you had Vince and Shane and the Stooges. Everybody is out here screwing The Rock over. They're hitting The Rock with chair shots. Vince McMahon's fucking falling over himself, uh, hitting The Rock with a chair, uh, looking stiff as ever. And the glass, th and this was Stone Cold had been gone for six months on injury, and all of a sudden the glass breaks, and the the crowd just loses their fucking minds. Austin comes out with a steel chair, clocks Triple H, clocks poor Gerald Briscoe, who really eats a, a solid chair shot to the dome. Uh, he goes in and he just he's clocking everybody with chair shots. Uh, lays out Triple H, uh, ends up leaving, and then Linda McMahon comes down with Earl Hebner. Uh, she pushes down Stephanie McMahon, who kind of tries to get in her way, um, and then uh, The Rock hits the people's elbow on uh, Triple H after he, he, well, first he hits the spine buster as a counter to Triple H trying to hit him with the chair, and then he hits the people's elbow, and Hebner counts the three for the win in The Rock is your WWE champion. But yeah, the return of Austin to help uh, one of his greatest nemeses uh, because of the feud that he had going on with uh, Triple H, which would end up leading, I'm pretty sure, to the one of my favorite three stages of hell matches between Triple H and Stone Cold. Um, but yeah, this return at Backlash 2000, always going to be one of my favorite ones. You'll you'll remember it right away because it's the one where he hits Triple H and then he almost like spins around in a 360 and just slams Briscoe right on the dome. Fantastic. Chef's kiss. All right. Number five. Let's clear through some of these. Number five. CM Punk returns. At Survivor Series Chicago in 2023. This is just this past year. Uh, so uh, CM Punk obviously uh, would return. Had a run at the Royal Rumble. Unfortunately got injured and has now been ensconced in this feud with Drew McIntyre. Which you could argue has been the feud of the year. So we don't have to linger too long on this. Obviously, a little bit of recency bias. I think the run in AEW, it is what it is. We're not going to dwell on it. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to focus exclusively on his return since coming back to WWE. And in spite of the injury, I would argue that it has been extremely positive for CM Punk since returning to WWE, bearing a lot of old skeletons. Uh, so I think kudos to him and the company for that. We can move right along. Number four, The Undertaker returns at Survivor Series 2005. So this is my favorite version of The Undertaker. Look at this motherfucker. Looks like he could be played by Russell Crowe. Jesus Christ. What a scary, ominous son of a bitch. So The Undertaker, um, if you guys remember, this was the one with Randy Orton, the legend killer. So he uh, set him on fire. Uh, uh, I think it was on a SmackDown or something. And then The Undertaker would return in a flaming casket on Survivor Series. And then he would clear out pretty much uh, the entire, like all of the jabroni uh, part of the locker room trying to get to Randy Orton, uh, who would run away like uh, the proper chicken shit heel he was back then. Uh, and this would lead to uh, Randy Orton and Undertaker's feud, one of the best feuds of uh, Randy's early career. Uh, it would, I'm pretty sure that's what also set up their Hell in a Cell match. 
Uh, but yeah, Undertaker returning at Survivor Series 2005 with the with the lightning and the flames on the casket, him busting out of the casket, uh, and then just murdering everyone. And this was peak Undertaker uh, in in uh, 2005. So. This is my, I know there's Undertaker's had a lot of returns. I know there's people who would argue there's the one where uh, he returns against Kane uh, and uh, the lightning hit the, hit the coffin. And that was back when kayfabe was like much more of a thing. So like, I get it. But for me, when I think of Undertaker returns, there's, there's always two I think of. There's the one where he sits up in the coffin and then there's, but there's also, this is the cooler one, is when he busts out of the flaming coffin and you have Randy Orton <laughs> fearing for his life in the ring. That's the one that I always think of. So that's why I wanted to make sure I had it on this list. And it'll push us into number three. Wrestling has more than one royal family. Do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, I can't sing worth a damn. Cody Rhodes returns to the WWE at WrestleMania 38 uh, uh, against Seth Rollins as his mystery opponent. He would defeat Seth Rollins. Obviously, this would then lead to him uh, facing Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 39 and defeating Roman Reigns recently at WrestleMania 40. Uh, our reigning defending. WWE Undisputed Champion currently remains Monsieur Cody Rhodes. So I think you could definitely argue that it was a successful return, um, including that brutal Hell in a Cell match that he wrestled with his pec literally falling off his fucking chest. That still is one of the gnarliest things I think I've ever seen in a wrestling ring is just a... Honestly, the reaction, I still t the re remember the reaction from the crowd. Just the, ooh, ooh. I've heard a lot of wrestling reactions in my life. A collective, ooh, from the crowd. That's one that really kind of sticks in my, in my mind. And that's how the entire crowd reacted when Cody Rhodes took off his, uh, his fancy jacket for that Hell in a Cell match against Seth Rollins and his whole fucking chest. Yo, it looked like The Rock's tattoo. You know how The Rock's got, like, the tattoo of, like, his entire... Except it was just a bruise. It was literally just a huge... Oh, my fuck. Ugh. Oh, I couldn't even imagine, like... I could not imagine just trying to, like, sit up. Like, just think about, like, having that and the, the feeling of when you have to, like, try and go just from a prone laying position to like a sitting position how much that would fucking hurt oh cody rhodes you are one tough sob all right number two the game the cerebral assassin the king of kings the nickname motherfucker triple h oh yeah triple h returning at raw uh uh this was in 2002. This is January 7th, so a day before my birthday in 2002. Triple H would return after a gnarly, gnarly quad injury would take him out. I think he was out for like eight months or something. He was out for a long motherfucking time. Came back with the full motorhead, the full jean jacket outfit, uh, and probably one of the biggest face reactions that Triple H has ever garnered in his entire career. Infamously told, uh, you know, Billy Gunn uh, and the rest of D-Generation X uh, when he wanted to break up the band and kind of go do his own thing that, you know, I see Austin and, and The Rock getting to the absolute heights of this business and I want to be there with them, but I want to be on the other side as the heel. And I think that was a brilliant move by Triple H kind of assessing the landscape and realizing that, yes, there absolutely was a, a gap in the market, so to speak, a space for him to fill as the ultimate heel. And I, I tell you, when I was that age, 
I don't think there was a heel I hated more than fucking Triple H when Triple H was like full heel, like McMahon Helmsley era, or even uh, uh, no beard, uh, long hair evolution. Triple H, like, oh my fuck. The man could be, there's certain guys where it's like, you know, and he was genuinely, it was crazy because like, genuinely he could make you like him and then when he turned heel it almost made it that much worse of like because i i know you could be cool but the fact that you were such a son of a bitch and just make me like when jr would be like uh talking about triple h cussing him out like you felt that shit in your soul so uh but this was again uh obviously like i said absence makes the heart grow fonder triple h returning in 2002 Goes down still uh, as one of the greatest returns. I know some of these are muddled. There's like different kinds of returns. I just, these are my top 10 favorites, whatever. And there's definitely, I can already tell you, there's some omissions from the list. Actually, before we get into number one here, just quickly um, off the top of my head, like I left Daniel Bryan off the list on purpose because when he returned in 2018, obviously that was like amazing. It was just fantastic to have him back from injury. But I felt like that was really short lived. And then he did, he did the heel stuff as the environmentalist, which I think a lot of people hated. I loved it. I want to go on record. I fucking loved Captain Planet heel Daniel Bryan. I thought that shit was brilliant. The wooden title, I thought that was hysterical. Like, I was all for that. I thought that was an amazing gimmick. I think a lot of people just really, I think people hated it so much that it had a little bit of go away heat, but I thought it was amazing. So that didn't make the list. And because we were sticking to WWE, obviously I didn't want to include like in TNA. Uh, Kurt Angle's had some pretty cool returns. Uh, you know, AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, those type of guys. There's been some amazing returns in NJPW and Ring of Honor and all kinds of other companies. Obviously, also excluding AEW. Um, and, like, you know, even going right back to Brian Danielson and when he showed up in AEW. But, again, th that's like, okay, well, is that a return to indie wrestling or is that a debut? Like, you know, you can slice that bread however you want to slice it. But we'll delay no further for me. My favorite return of all time, I honestly, like, it. It this would be in any company, in any circumstance, for any wrestler, my favorite return, it was on the thumbnail, you already know what it is by now, Edge returning at the Royal Rumble 2020, first of all, was a, I felt like that was a genuine surprise, uh, I it's hard to remember, but I, I remember there being maybe like some whispering, some rumors, but definitely like, you know, nobody thought it was confirmed. A lot of people didn't even think it was real. So when Edge came out, uh, and ironically, I believe he came out at number 20 and they, uh, that the, the look on his face, um, and I think what made this mean more to me personally. Ironically enough, uh, the Edge and Christian pod of awesomeness. So if you guys were a fan of that podcast, shout out to y'all because I was a fan too. I actually genuinely loved uh, Edge and Christian's podcast. They had all these hilarious inside jokes. Um, you know, like one of the, I still to this day, We'll sing, uh, uh, we're so sorry, little Dave Batista. We must leave you with this foster family. <laughs> I am here on my own. I'm so scared. We're so sorry, little Dave Batista. We must still leave you with this foster family. That's a fucking deep cut for anybody who knows what the fuck I'm talking about or singing about. Oh my. All right. Flip sunset and boom, <clears throat> Paul Smackage. Mm, mm. You don't want to get wrapped up in those vines by Paul Smackage. Bro, I made fucking Paul Smackage a character on WWE 2K. Like, that's how much I love that podcast. And uh, Edge 
one of the things that we talk about a lot is like if he was able to return to wrestling. And so genuinely, you know, when Edge returned to wrestling, obviously in WWE in 2020, already that was just like incredible. But honestly, even when he showed up in AEW, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people were like, oh, what the, you know, kind of confused about that and why he is kind of so rah rah there. And again, it's like, I think you maybe don't have the insight and perspective then of having listened to that show and genuinely understanding who Adam Copeland really is as a person. Because again, it's like, and yeah, it's a podcast. Again, it's, I'm not saying I know him, but you, you guys, obviously when you like, you know, I think everyone understands like when you listen to a show like that, you know, where a person is opening up uh, about their personal lives and about their thoughts and their feelings and, you know, their aspirations, like, yeah, you get to know them. You get to know that figure in a better sense than, you know, just random podcaster. Right. So it's weird. It's weird that I'm like talking about Edge as a fucking podcaster as opposed to like a professional wrestler. But like, yeah, it just it was different. Again, hearing him and um, Jay even just shoot the shit kind of about their relationship and their families and like again, understanding their motivations as wrestlers, the way that they view the business, the way that they talk about the business. Um, so again, when Edge went to AEW, I was not surprised at all. I was like, yeah, that's actually very on brand, uh, for him and what he wants to be able to do with the legacy of his career. So, um, you could even include that, but I'm really limiting to limiting this to like, literally I watched that moment a lot. Like that's one of my favorite, I would say even just moments in WWE is Edge's return at the Royal Rumble 2020. So if we're doing a top 10 list of returns, you bet your ass, you bet your bottom dollar that Edge is going to be number one for me. Uh, so if I left anybody off the list uh, that you really believe in, I believe in Joe Hendry. Then make sure that you hit me up at Jack Loosely on all my socials. Uh, let me know some more top times that you guys want to see in the future. Uh, shout at me for who I missed on this list. Uh, if you guys want to help out the show, well, I don't do uh, ads or sponsor any of that stuff. This is really organic grassroots. So if you want to super kick that subscribe button, like, share, comment, do all the stupid stuff, beat up on that old algorithm. We want to take him from the top rope, drop him on his head with a brain buster. Um, but until the next time, guys, I will catch all of you on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled the rats on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm a listic, vicious. Characteristics, I read the terrible potency. Yep, a set of gains, yo. Aim at the HMCs at a short and never speed. Some of the beers like, some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail below stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you, cockeyed, mumble rap, slack jaws. Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with the clothesline from hell. Like Bradshaw, I'm toxic like septic shock. A dying breed like anorexic dogs. My appetite are